Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this Green Transport Recovery webinar on lift sharing the Local Authority Toolkit Explained. I'm Susan Latham, the Local Authority Account Director at LiftShare, and I'm honoured to be chairing this webinar today. 84% of the UK population agree that climate change is a global emergency, yet 90% of cars in Russia have just one person in them meaning an inefficient 47 million empty seats and an eye-watering amount of emissions. According to a professor of climate change science, Corinne Lecare from the University of East Anglia, we all control about a quarter of our emissions. How we reduce our car usage alongside making its use more efficient is what we're going to look at today as it's a powerful way to reduce our carbon footprint and support the all important net zero goals. LiftShare was a contributor to the DFT's Lift Sharing Local Authority Toolkit and is the UK's largest car sharing platform. For the past 23 years, LiftShare has been supporting organisations across the UK, encourage their staff to share rides to work to save money reduce parking pressures and improve air quality. As a result, over a billion miles have been taken off the UK road network, equating to over a quarter of a million tonnes of CO2 emissions. Local authorities are vanguards in our national response to climate change and reaching net zero by 2050, with Scotland even aiming to be net zero by 2045. Over 280 councils across the UK have declared a climate emergency, with over two thirds in England, alongside Glasgow and Edinburgh, aiming to be carbon neutral by 2030. Decarbonising transport is crucial for hitting these goals. Lift sharing with local authorities can be a game changer. It supports Local authority, sorry, local communities who may not drive or not even have a car. It helps us all reduce our emissions and save money on ever increasing fuel costs. Council employees can adopt sustainable travel options as part of hybrid, hybrid working programs, patterns, sorry. And finally, local authorities can influence their local anchor institutions and businesses on how they address commuting behaviour change to support their own net zero goals. This new toolkit supports all of this. Now we've got some really amazing speakers today. On our panel, we have Harvey Byrne, Policy Advisor, Future of Transport from the Department of Transport, Tim Anderson, Head of Transport from the Energy Saving Trust, Ali Claburn, founder and chair of the LiftShare Group, and Matthew Ledbury, senior policy and advocacy officer from Como UK. So before we start, I'd like to thank Landor Links for organizing the webinar today. Do note it will be recorded. Each panelist is going to have about 10 minutes to give us their insights, followed by Q&A with the panel. I'm going to say this a lot throughout the webinar, so bear with me please post your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen. Let's leave the chat box for chatting as we don't want to overlook any of your questions once we get to the Q&A session at the end. So our august panel will now take a deep look at the toolkit, deconstructing the data and discussing best practice in car sharing. So let's get started. Harvey, um, would you like to begin? Thank you, uh, thank you, Susan. Let me just come off, come off video or come on video even. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it, so I can't come on video. Is that okay? That's fine, Harvey. Ca carry on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm Harvey Byrne. I am uh, in the Department for Transport, and I'm in the the Future of Transport uh, um, Directorate. Uh, yeah, and I'm a policy advisor in the team. Um, so today I was going to cover a few key points. Um, so I was going to give a bit of a sense of uh, some of the, I suppose, the context of the, of the TDP, the uh, Transport Decarbonisation Plan, 
I was, I was then going to touch upon, I suppose, what the actual toolkit is um, from a kind of a high level perspective. And then I was going to go into a little bit of detail on what the literature um, specific toolkit includes. I was also going to hopefully um, do a little piece on some of the some of the thinking in in the department on future policy, um, which we're kind of like, I suppose, mulling over. But due to uh, local elections, are quite restricted on what I can reveal in a public forum at this stage. Um, but yeah, happy to uh, at the end uh, to take questions and stuff, and I'll try and answer them as as honestly as I can. Um, so I'll kick off with basically a bit of an overview of what the TDP is. Um, so essentially, the TDP is seen as quite an ambitious plan, which sets out, um, I suppose, how the the transport sector um, will be put on a path to achieve net zero by uh, 2050. Um, the key part of the plan, um, or a key, a key part of the plan, is to tackle um, emissions by, uh, by caused by road vehicles. Um, and within that, the TDP has um, a range of commitments focused on shared mobility. Um, and the ones I think are most um, relevant here would be the um, commitments to increase average road vehicle occupancy by 2030. And obviously, of course, publishing guidance for local authorities on shared uh, shared car ownership um, and and uh, occupancy schemes. Um, so, what is the um, local authority transport decarbonisation toolkit? So, essentially, the toolkit is a guidance tool um, designed to provide guidance and advice to local authorities in planning and delivering measures to reduce carbon emissions um, um, regarding uh, transportation. And it does this by highlighting the benefits of different interventions, setting out uh, the key actions local authorities can take, sharing best practice and lessons learned from case studies of successful schemes um, already being delivered um, and, and local benefits already being realized. Um, and it also does it by signposting other um, published guidance and methodologies um, by other organizations. Um, so there's several toolkits um covering a whole range of i suppose transport areas um such as um uh zero zero emission uh, fleets and active travel but obviously the one we're going to talk about today is is the lift sharing toolkit so what is the lift um sharing toolkit what's included in it um so the garden sets out some initial principles um that local authorities can, can consider or should should and can consider um when thinking about setting up a lift sharing scheme or, or support mechanism. So I think the first thing um, the toolkit covers is, is local authorities should, should consider if they want to set up, I suppose, an informal or formal um, lift sharing um, arrangement. So the informal arrangement would be, I suppose, seen as more peer-to-peer -peer or friend-to-friend -friend, um, uh, relationship in, in, in lift sharing. And I think uh, local authorities can do this best by, I suppose, promoting behavior change, encouraging people to, to lift share through comms, um, et cetera. And then a more formal arrangement would be, I suppose, when your local authority can set up, I suppose, a more direct intervention, um, like supporting apps or websites that bring people together to, to, to connect and share lists. Next thing to consider, I suppose, is, um, is if the scheme would be open and closed, open or closed even. Um, an open relationship um, or an open scheme would be more focused on uh, the general public, um, the general public having access to the scheme. Um, and a more closed relationship would perhaps be where there's a set uh, number or set people can, can use a scheme, such as a business park setting up um, a lift sharing scheme to get to work. So only the people who work in that business park could use it. Um, but it also, um, the, 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 the toolkit also sets out some of the, who, are the, who are the key industry leaders um, that the local authorities can consider engaging with as well. And also it, it sets out some of the key benefits for lift sharing. So I'll go a bit more into detail around, I suppose, some of the steps that local authorities um, can consider. I think the first one is, is to consider undertaking um, a feasibility assessment. So this is about, about considering what interventions would best suit the local needs, um, what, what, what different interventions or methodologies can be used, the costs associated with that, the potential impacts, and also the potential benefits for each intervention um, would yield. Um, and the next stage would be, I suppose, establishing a strategy for the lift sharing locally. Um, now, this can be like, a, I suppose, a stand, standalone strategy, or it can be built into the wider uh, local authority or local um, strategy trans, um, transport strategies. The next stage would be around developing a business case. 
Um, so again, this is about understanding feasibility of different approaches, the benefits um, the different approaches have, the impacts um, it could yield, and also um, how, how each um, intervention could be implemented in a practical way. Um, and then the next stage would be, I suppose, setting up um, and procuring a lift um, sharing service. So this is about considering how to develop, um, I suppose, how to develop and propose, um, oh, sorry, excuse me, this is about, I suppose, how do you actually deliver the, the lift sharing? What tech is um, needed? Um, what resources um, might be required? And what the, um, what the best value for money option might be? And then one of the final stages is, is I suppose, how to engage and promote the lift sharing locally so we get enough people signing up and some different ideas in the toolkit around um, about maybe appointing lift sharing champions or coordinators or having a comms campaign um, to, to drive up um, uptake but also it includes advice around what incentives could be used such as can we include um, dedicated parking bays for, for, lift, for lift share users that seems quite a powerful incentive to get people um, um, using um, the services. Another really key important area is, is to consider is how you monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of any lift, any lift sharing scheme. So this is all about um, understanding what is working locally, how can we improve it, how do we um, generate data um, and feedback from users to understand how what is working and what can be improved. This is really important, I suppose, I suppose as we kind of like embark on this, this new era of, of shared mobility, is understanding what does work in different contexts and different areas. Um, and then I think the final thing it gives advice on is um, how to build, how to consider and build in live sharing considerations with new planning, planning developments. So how do you create um, environments which are I suppose, lift share, lift share friendly, um, which facilitate for more lift sharing for the future? Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of like a bit of detail on what's included in, in the toolkit. And the final thing I'd say is that um, I think this is the first iteration of the toolkit and it's designed to be, I suppose, it's, it's designed to evolve over time as we, do, as we get feedback from users and local authorities or what else, what, what additional advice would be useful. Um, so yeah, it's very much an iterative process. Um, so we're happy to hear feedback um, and discuss how to improve going forward. So I think brilliant. that's me for now. Lovely. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Harvey. Um, we've had questions coming in on the Q&A, which is brilliant. Um, I can answer a couple now just to say, yes, the web recording of this webinar will be made available at the end. So please continue to post questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm now going to introduce you um, to Tim, who, like Harvey, won't be using slides, but the final two um, presenters will be. So please don't think that you're not connected correctly. So, um, Tim, can I hand over to you? You can, Susan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm uh, surprised at how much you're all missing the slides. Um, uh, I, I decided not to use slides because what I wanted to do is really give a little bit more of an inspirational um piece rather than kind of going into the detail to be honest with you uh, ali who will be following me uh, uh, is the kind of uk's expert on lift sharing uh, i didn't want to uh, try and steal any of his thunder although i will be stealing some of his statistics uh, but anyway my name's tim anderson as it says on the screen i'm the group head of transport at the energy saving trust uh, we're a not-for-profit organization running a number of um, schemes and programs uh, across the uk helping people decarbonize in in my case in the area of transportation um, it's amazing to see so many of you actually here and that just goes to show the level of interest that there is in lift sharing which is absolutely fabulous um, so it's really great to be here uh, I'm just going to talk for a short time in order to leave uh, time for Ali and also Matthew later from Como UK um, to really bring some of the detail around this but perhaps just for a minute if you will indulge me uh, I wanted to kind of give a slightly bigger picture to where lift sharing fits into the uh, decarbonisation strategy. Uh, we're really pleased to be supporting uh, DFT with the creation of the uh, local authority toolkit and as Harvey said it is an iterative process so if you do spot anything that's missing or uh, lacks detail then please uh, do let us know. 
one thing that I would say is um, that there's more tools to come, uh, there's more content to come, and we will be working on it over the next few months uh, to continue to enhance the existing content and to bring some new content as well. Okay, let's just start to think about lift sharing in the context of why more people don't do it. Why are we so addicted to driving around in our own cars? Well, I've got a challenge for you. And, and if we were in a room together, I would ask you to raise your hands. Uh, I'm not going to do that now because it'd be <laughs> those little yellow hands that all go up probably wouldn't make much sense. Um, but what I would say is how many of you on a, on a regular basis are actively lift sharing, either with a colleague on your way to and from work or on the school run when you take your kids to school or for any social activities that you may do. And probably most of you would sort of sheepishly put your hand up thinking that, yeah, I've got to say yes, otherwise I'm gonna you know, look foolish. The fact of the matter is that actually lift sharing is something of a kind of cultural barrier for many of us. And I know from my own personal experience, and I'll give you one example from my family life, where my son who plays football at quite a high level, uh, around the Midlands, um, quite often the team will have to away matches all over the place. And I'm sort of in the middle of the Midlands in Leicestershire. And sometimes we have to go all the way up to Congleton near Manchester. Sometimes we have to go all the way down to Gloucester. And um, so often everyone is resistant about car sharing on a Saturday morning. For whatever reason, uh, it feels that it's a real uphill struggle to say, shall we uh, share lifts and that is interesting to me and I think that's the same for our commuting that's often the same for our school runs um, and other areas of our social and family life as well of course the other major barrier the biggest barrier perhaps that we were never fully aware of but we are now in these last two years is the idea of not sharing our personal space with anybody because of the risk of infection, um, in this case, COVID. But I don't know about you, I think the pandemic, what it served to do is create in us a sort of um, sense of being germophobic. We've all become germophobes. Even now in this kind of post, um, and I know we're not fully through it, but we're getting through it. Uh, I don't know about you, but I find myself sort of jumping away from people as I'm walking down the street, just because it's become a habit or feeling a bit strange about going to shake someone's hand. And those are strange things that have happened to us in these unprecedented times. Um, one of the stats that Ali shared with me around um, changes in habits around commuting is that where people were sharing um, lifts to get to and from work, that's actually down 47%. Um, and equally bus patronage is down 25%. And those things are recovering, but I think we've got a bit of a uphill uh, struggle. So obviously government guidance made sense at the time. That government guidance is no longer there. So let's be absolutely clear about that. It is okay and legal and fine to share lifts. And let's make sure that we challenge ourselves about our own personal behavior about whether we set the benchmark. One of the things that I was quite heartened to see at the weekend actually is a convergence between um, the lift sharing or car sharing agenda and the car club agenda. I was reading uh, an article in The Guardian actually and there's a number of schemes uh, emerging, one particular one in Oxford that I was interested to read where people are volunteering their own vehicle. So rather than being a pure car club, run by an, another company, um, those people's cars are actually being shared with an outside company facilitating the booking and the insurance. And that sends to me a clear signal. Yes, of course, there's a clear distinction between car clubs and lift sharing. And we'll hear a little bit more about car clubs later on uh, with Matthew from Como UK. But what's good news in my view is that there does seem to be a move, a social move towards sharing of resources, sharing of vehicles, um, recognizing that 95% of the time our vehicles sit un, 
used on the driveway or in the street. And what's even better from our point of view, and as you probably know, we do a lot of work on EVs, is that a lot of these vehicles will be EVs. And that, of course, has a great benefit in terms of emissions. Just a brief note, Harvey's talked about the toolkit. Um, obviously, it's really important that to recognize that LiftShare had um, a part to play in pulling together the uh, case studies. Do have a look at it. One of the things that actually I was just reflecting on is a couple of um, targets that have been offered, actually in this case, specifically around active travel. So in England, half journeys in towns and cities will be cycled or walked by 2030 is uh, the Westminster government's ambition. And in Scotland, they have a target of reducing car kilometers by 20% by 2030. Either way, there is a move within government to encourage people, as Harvey was saying, within the decarbonisation plan, to use their vehicles less and to take other forms of transport, whether that's walking, cycling, it's modal shift into bus and uh, train or other forms of public transport, or indeed by using our cars better uh, by filling them up with people. So please do have a look at the toolkit. Hope you have already. One of the other pieces of work that we're going to be working on again with DFT during this year, and this is sort of brand new and is separate to the toolkit, by the way, is Commute Zero. So if you've read the um, decarbonisation plan, and it is a thick document, so, um, uh, so be warned. But one of the things is Commute Zero, is the idea that we think about how we get to and from work. Now, of course, um, within that, I would also include the school run. It's a form of commuting, and it's actually when I look at local schools and um, uh, you, you know the traffic around them actually this is an important part an important discussion around commuting just want to highlight the point that you know we as an organization and I won't speak for anybody else but certainly from our point of view we're not anti-car you know the car is something that offers freedom and independence um, and you know that's really not the point but actual single occupancy of cars is fundamentally wasteful and obviously if we reduce the number of um sorry if we increase the, the our car occupancy by 20 percent say which is a an achievable target then we will reduce because we will have cars not being used they will just be uh, either not there or sitting on someone's drive we can reduce our emissions by 20 percent and car miles as well so let's fill up our cars that is my challenge. Now it's not, you know, easy, but some of the things that are talked about in the toolkit that Harvey's mentioned create an opportunity. And I think now more than ever, while we are in this, in the midst of this cost of living crisis, we have an opportunity to promote car sharing, lift sharing. As fuel costs rise, and um, I know you'll probably hear this more than once today, um, it's never been a more opportune time to promote the idea of sharing the cost of the fuel, effectively halving your fuel cost for your commute by uh, sharing the cost with uh, somebody else. Also, we've seen some interesting changes, haven't we, around the pandemic about how people work. Um, a lot of us, like me right now, um, sitting in my spare bedroom in northwest Leicestershire, and that has become the norm. And I don't think we'll ever fully return, uh, in most cases, to going into the office on a full time basis. I know there are moves to uh, encourage so certainly civil servants and other uh, areas to get back into the office. But I don't think we will ever see a full return and a the full extent of business travel and commuting that we had before. And for that reason, I think we have a great opportunity right now to say when you are traveling, if possible, use more sharing um, opportunities. Some of the things that do work are incentives. And, you know, we always talk about the carrot and the stick. Well, certainly the carrot is useful. We see this in all, all areas of, uh, of life. Um, I know that, you know, if you go over to Los Angeles and you'll be driving along the six, seven, eight lane highways, there's usually a car sharing lane or a carpool lane. Um, makes me think of carpool karaoke um, and those are brilliant uh, it's actually shocking to see how many cars don't use it and are stuck in 
traffic jam because they're all just filled with one person. In this country, I think that's probably less likely just because we don't have space for another lane uh, and the political kind of tox toxic nature of kind of allocating road space to certain groups. We saw that on the M4 bus lane, didn't we, a few years ago. But some of the other things that can work are dedicated parking for people who share. You've just got to be aware of some of the unintended consequences of, um, I can't remember exactly which nuclear power station it was. I think it was the one up in Cumbria, but um, some of the staff were a little bit sneaky and they drove to a nearby village, all parked their cars and then piled into someone's car in order to get some of the dedicated parking, which was near the building. So watch out for those. But I mean, dedicated parking can certainly work. And what about this? This is my own idea. I might patent this myself. Car cleaning vouchers or a free sanitizing kit just to kind of overcome some of the issues of, oh, I don't like traveling in other people's cars because they're dirty or they may not be uh, fully sanitized. So what about that for an idea? Um, one of the ones I think is really important is guarantee guaranteeing a, a ride home or, or emergency travel for a lot of people. And, you know, if you've got kids, you will identify with this. If you're at work and you get a call to say the kids at nursery or at school has had an accident or is poorly, you need to get home. So I think it's important that employers uh, take the initiative and guarantee uh, employees a lift home if they are car sharing. Um, that's also true where people have to work different hours and so on. I think there's a real opportunity there. And finally, just thinking about whether the targets or goals are appropriate as they are in the area of active travel, perhaps here in lift sharing as well to increase car occupancy. So just to finish, I think it's important that local authorities, employers, particularly large employers, promote lift sharing. Let's make it part of the national narrative about how we travel to and from work for the commute, how we get around socially and how we take our kids to school. It offers an opportunity to overcome the cost of living crisis, the emissions, air quality emissions crisis, the climate crisis, the congestion crisis, all these crises that we're facing, lift sharing is part of the toolkit to tackling some of them. Just one final thought as well, just this idea of being socially distanced. I think it's important that we are socially, well, just social, being together. And that helps us overcome by just being in the car together, talking, perhaps a social mental health and well-being crisis as well. We'll continue to work with government, with local authorities, with organisations like Lift Share to promote car sharing, lift sharing. But do remember this. It starts with you. It starts with us, all of us here, uh, promoting lift sharing in our own lives, modelling good behaviour and showing everybody how it's done. So that's everything from me. Thanks very much, Susan. Back to you. That was great, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, Ali Claburn will follow us next. Um, and obviously, I've had a sneak preview of Ali's slides, and I'm just going to take the opportunity to answer one of the questions which has come up in the chat box. So please remember to put your questions in the Q&A section rather than the chat box. But just to let Helen know, yes, LiftShare is available on a Crown Commercial Service framework, which would help take away some of the heavy lifting for you. So, Ali, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you uh, to Harvey and Tim. Uh, absolutely delighted to be with you today. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I just want to give an overview of, of where we are now. We've heard about why this is really important. I want to reiterate that. I want to share some of the updates from a huge commuter census survey we did uh, just back in March. And I want to share some of the best practice examples of, of local authority engagement in this space um, in previous years. Check that and go forwards. Perfect. So at a high level, um, local authorities uh, can uh, influence around a third of all emissions. And as transport is a larger source of emissions and commuting is a larger source of transport emissions, and as Tim said, single occupancy commuting accounts for 82% of all commuting emissions. The, the importance of uh, tackling this is it couldn't, can't be underestimated at all. Um, uh, and the other obviously big crisis at the moment is a cost of living crisis and the impact this is having on working families um, and basically the whole, whole of the country um, right now. 
Uh, as fuel prices go up, people need to find different ways to do things. And sharing a car is the simplest way to halve your fuel costs. It's available right now and there are seats available uh, in cars on pretty much every single road in the country. Um, here are just a few of the many hundreds of thousands of members of, of LiftShare who have shared through the system. I just wanna look at the top two. You've got Eddie and Claire. Uh, they uh, share their car to work. Uh, they both save around a thousand pounds a year and well over a ton of CO2 each. So it's a thousand pounds cash in pocket for them. And you see from the others, uh, our average member saves around a thousand pounds a year. Some save two, 3,000. If you're doing a shorter journey, it's less. Uh, but right now that's gone up significantly. And even though um, fuel prices um, have gone up, it's still around a thousand pounds because on, on average, people are commuting three days a week now rather than four as they were prior to the pandemic. Um, so I won't dwell too long on this, but we've just done this huge survey, uh, 11,000 commuter responses. And what it showed is some really interesting things. It's shown obviously the worrying declines in public transport use, bus, uh, pre-pandemic, um, around 8% dropping and then uh, predicted actually next year to drop again in terms of how people expect to be traveling. But if you look at the, the kind of purple line, that's, that's what really starts to give us encouragement. This line is showing what modes people would consider or are considering right now. So although bus use may be 8%, over 20% of people say they will consider it. Again, for car sharing, car sharing is 50% down, nearly 50% down on where it was pre-pandemic. So that's a million uh, fewer people sharing cars every day. That's the same number as the total number of, of people traveling by train pre-pandemic. It's a huge number. But when we look at the purple line, it's showing the big opportunity for people to, um, uh, the, the people who are considering car sharing now. What's really exciting is the pink line. So the pink line is when we ask, could you be encouraged to car share? And we've done this for all modes, but I've just highlighted the car sharing one. Over 80% of the respondents said they could be encouraged to car share. And then we start looking at what would encourage them. And later on, I'll give you another example of a, of a uh, NHS trust to share some more data on this. The exciting thing about, about um, lift sharing is that uh, the opportunity is there for nearly everyone to do it tomorrow. 90% of the journeys that we've analysed have at least one person that that person can share with within walking distance of the house going to the same place of work. Over 80% of, of the analysis of people we've analysed show that they've got 10 or more people that they can share with within walking distance of their house going to the same place of work. There's a huge opportunity today. Um, I'm sharing this side for many, for many reasons. A, because it makes me smile. It reminds me of uh, a very happy uh, comedy, um, but also the impact that this had on car sharing in the UK. Uh, we saw a 400% increase in traffic to our lift share site when this went live, which shows you there's a huge latent capacity out there, people willing to consider this, and they just need a nudge, and local authorities have got a key role in making that happen. So to give you a bit of background on, on lift share, what you see here is uh, the growth in the miles saved by lift share members um, over the years. And you can see up until 2019, it was an exponential curve. We basically worked out the magic dust to help employers to get their staff sharing cars with some really rapid successes. Clearly the pandemic came along and the, um, the miles saved decreased, but still we were saving 150 million miles uh, each year for the last two years. And it's on the increase. And actually in the last couple of months, the, the, the uh, increase has, has expedited massively due to the rapid rise in fuel prices. There have been quite a lot of uh, research documents done into uh, lift sharing over the years. This one I want to draw your attention to. If you are a local authority and you're looking at um, uh, lift sharing, look at this as well as a toolkit. ITP did some great work for Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, they were particularly focusing on the rural areas, but within the, the area, there are some uh, big urban areas too. And they came up with some really interesting conclusions, which I'll summarize. But to put lift sharing in context of other options and the return on investment. So one conclusion they came to was, to get someone car sharing and to, to save each kilometre, um, car kilometre by car sharing, cost local authorities 1.7p uh, per kilometre. That compared to 10p cost per kilometre for the other smarter choice options or one pound per kilometre for DRT. So if you're a rural area and you're looking at DRT and looking at the different options, make sure you consider lift sharing as a key element within that because it is by far the biggest return on investment you'll get in terms of taking uh, cars off the road. Within that uh, document, they looked at lots of case studies, which is why I'd encourage you to look at it. The main one was CarShare Devon. So CarShare Devon have done an amazing job of raising awareness across Devon of their lift sharing scheme. 
they had around 40 of uh, these variable message signs that they put up um, on the roads that they moved around Devon uh, each six months. Um, and that made they, meant they had over 90% awareness in Devon of their lift sharing scheme. They've currently got over 11,000 members of their umbrella group. It's a public scheme for anyone in Devon to join. And then underneath that, lots of companies, employers, public sector, private sector, have their own private communities. So they could, members of those groups can choose just to share with their own with their own staff or to widen out to the public network. To show you one example of how it works, so uh, here is a member traveling to hospital in, in Exeter every day. If they look within their own group, they've got eight matches they can share with. Here's Rebecca's journey popping up. But if they widen it to the uh, national network, they've got 18 journeys because they're widening out to a much bigger pool of, of journeys. So the benefits of being part of a network rather than just having a private scheme is you've got the opportunity to, to share with many, many more people. Here is a map of all the uh, journeys in Devon, just to show you it's a mix of urban and rural. There are pretty much people on in every um, uh, uh, populated area across Devon. And the graph on the right shows you the increase year on year of the members. The key figure I want to draw your attention to is the £6 million saving that members have made in Devon by sharing their journeys. It's a huge sum and far, I mean, it, the return on investment for the local authorities compared to that number is well over 50 to 1. So for every £50, the, the council, have, uh, for every £1 the council have invested, uh, members have saved over 50. Um, it's a big return on uh, the money they've invested. Um, in terms of the uh, summary of the research, they concluded that car sharing already provides a valuable role within local communities and is an essential element of a transport network. And I think it's really important to say that when you look at uh, car sharing, as many people car share now um, as travel by bus or train. In fact, more there are more people car sharing than travel by bus or train, and yet it doesn't really get half as much attention as, as either of those other modes. All are important, but in areas where there is limited public transport and journeys are too far to walk or cycle, lift sharing provides an absolutely essential role uh, to, to enable access, affordable access to those people. The research concludes a few things, um, and I've just highlighted some here. One is, as a local authority, it's really important to define your objectives to increase uptake and occupancy of lift sharing. You need a clearly defined strategy, in particular focusing on resources to help market the scheme and to work with employers to help drive up their engagement. Um, consider infrastructure. Tim talks about HOV lanes. Uh, bus lanes can be converted to HOV lanes if they're HOV lanes if they're being underutilized. But also consider parking, particularly public parking. Can you start introducing car share bays on in public parking spaces? Monitor uptake and occupancy, and I've got a slide on that in a second. And use the tools you've got. Many local authorities either have a lift sharing scheme, or have access to a regional scheme, or if you don't, get one. But if you've got one, make sure you're using it and promoting it and monitoring it and have someone who's responsible for it. So there are many ways to, to measure occupancy. Uh, Norwich and Norfolk have, I think, taken the lead on this. And now every year they undertake a car occupancy survey across the city of Norwich. This is just one, one example of data from it from a few years ago. Uh, but it, what it highlights is across the day, uh, over 80% of cars only have one person in them. That means there's a huge latent capacity in pretty much every car coming in and out of the city. So when the city are looking to uh, reduce cars or maybe uh, reallocate road space, there's plenty of space in those cars to get more people showing, which will then free up space for walking, cycling and other public transport modes. In terms of engaging with uh, uh, ca uh, companies, there are lots again of examples like this, but I wanna highlight Arab. So the key thing about Arab is they launched their lift share scheme back in 2000, I think, uh, 16. Um, and they got went from 8% of their staff sharing lifts pre the scheme to over 50% within three months of launching. And they did that through a very effective uh, communication campaign, but also allocating uh, reserve car, car parking spaces for the car sharers. And the shift across was instant, and they now don't have any parking issues at site, and it's been a huge success. Oop, oh, back screen, oh, okay. So what this slide is, is showing is the network across the UK. And this was mainly driven by all the local authorities who helped promote the scheme between around 2006 and 2015. You can see that the network extends everywhere and has obviously now gone across um, into Europe and, and across Ireland too. Um, but what it shows is, is where you see lots of light, that's where typically the scheme has been well promoted by local authorities. Um, we've analysed uh, the census data for every single region in the country, and I just want to highlight some of this to you, ooh, to you now. So in England, there are 36 million empty seats on the road every day. 
In the West Midlands, there are 4 million empty seats in, in the West Midlands every day, and there are only 1 million commuters in the West Midlands. So you've got 4 million empty seats, 1 million commuters. Uh, in Richmond, you've got 23 drivers for every one passenger. 23 drivers for every one passenger on the commute. The national average is 11, but that's still 11 drivers for every one passenger. That's an incredibly inefficient use of all these empty seats on the road. It's not the cars that are the problem, it's how we're using them that uh, needs to be improved. Um, and this is one slide that I really want to, to dwell on. I was with uh, Chris Boardman this morning, who did an amazing pitch for how important uh, active travel is, and he's spot on. Active travel is really, really important. However, the challenge is that um, even though 42% uh, of people can walk or cycle to work, if all of them did, because of the short distances that they're traveling, we'd only save 6% of the total emissions from commuting. So if everyone who could walk or cycle did, we'd save 6%. Public transport, 54% of people could use public transport. And if everyone did who could, we would save 10%. Clearly working from home uh, is a very different case. 40% of people can work from home, and if they do, we'll save 30% of emissions. But for lift sharing, 90%, as I said earlier, of people could lift share to work. And if they did, we'd save 35% of, of all commuting emissions. Every one of these has a role to play, but it's really important to put it in context that, that we can't just focus on active travel and buses. We need to think how to make better use of cars if we're serious about decarbonizing transport. Um, so I just want to look now at um, more data for a uh, NHS trust and to highlight car sharing. As I showed earlier with the national picture from the census, um, when you look at it from a, on a company by company level, you get a very similar picture. So uh, in this case, you can see the car sharing area highlighted. Uh, only 6% of their staff were car sharing pre-pandemic and only 6% think they'll be car sharing next year. However, 28% of them are currently considering it and over 60% um, uh, could be encouraged to. But then we ask through the, through the Mobility Way survey, what would encourage them to change? When we look at public transport, the key um, things that would encourage people to change are subsidised or cheaper fares, improved bus timetables, and making sure people have got up-to-date information on what services are available. But when we look at lift sharing, the key one that comes out is if people can find someone who shares their route to work. And that's where, if you've got a lift sharing scheme, promote it, and if you haven't got one, please set one up because if you can help uh, your population, your community, your business to find others who share, who, who they can share with to, to work, then you, you tackle this, this barrier straight away. Um, and just to finish, I wanna go back to these uh, two wonderful posters from uh, I think the very first Lift Share Week we did. Um, we used to have Lift Share Day, this was the first Lift Share Week. And this was when I think fuel prices hit one pound 10 and everyone was up in arms because they were, they were very expensive. Obviously, they're now more like £1.70, so there's a bigger, bigger issue. But it's just when we look back at probably when we first started to drive and fuel prices were a very different uh, place to where they are now, um, um, say they were at like 80p or 50p. If you share your car, we get back there. If you share it with two people right now, it'd be 90p. If you share it with three people, it'd be 60p. So please don't just think that fuel prices are expensive. It's how we use our cars that make them expensive. If we all share our cars, we can go back to having fuel, fuel prices that are affordable for the vast majority of the population. And with that, I'd like to finish. We would love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, um, and thank you so much for, for, for joining the webinar today. Ali, thank you very much. I love the data that drives the fuel of uh, lift share behavior change. That was brilliant. Um, a quick reminder to everybody to please post questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, and yes, this webinar will be shared with everybody later on at the Land or Links YouTube channel. So, Matthew, are you ready to now take the floor? Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll, I'll keep this one uh, fairly brief, I think, um, so you're not all feeling uh, crushed by too many presentations today. Um, what I wanted to do was just give a bit of background um, to where we're coming at, coming um, from in terms of the wider impact in terms of um, shared transport. Um, I think it's worth saying, first of all, that the, the background to a lot of this, and in particular to the, the toolkit, it was the, is the drive towards transport decarbonisation. 
And certainly when you look at where we're at and where we need to be, um, the changes are really um, quite eye-watering in terms of, of what needs to be done. And really, I, th I think practically we have to be prepared to throw just about um, everything we can at it. Uh, Tim mentioned earlier that, that in Scotland they've uh, adopted a policy of a 20% um, reduction in car kilometrage by 2030. Uh, and uh, they just recently finished a, a consultation to look at the various ways that that might be achieved. But in terms of what we know about transport patterns um, and the, the general trends over the uh, last few decades, it's certainly going to mean reversing uh, a lot of what we know. But anyway, I think that the good thing is, as we saw uh, just now with, with Alice's presentation and generally, is that um, things um, uh, can move in the right direction and we need to continue giving them um, a big shove, if you like, um, to continue taking them that way. Um, what I've got uh, to share a bit with you uh, today is some of the data from um, our latest travel survey. Um, some of you may know that Coma UK does an annual uh, does annual surveys, including one on car share that we've done for um, well over a decade now. Um, this, the uh, latest reports are just due to come out um, this month, um, but I've got some of the, the data to show you um, in advance just so you can see where things are at. And the, um, the good sign I'm, I'm pleased to say is that the trends continue to be in the right direction. Um, so if I can have the first slide, please. Um, so the basic message as it, as it is, is, is that people are continuing um, to get out of private, private car ownership and move towards um, car sharing. Not nearly as big as we'd like yet, but it's certainly um, going that way. Um, the interesting thing is in terms of um, car club members um, is the significant increase, even in the context of um, coming out of COVID. Um, you can see the figures there um, that we've now got, I think a total of uh, over three quarters of a million car club members. Um, in terms of actual active members, and that's that um, who are actually using it um, once a year or more, um, it's ne now nearly half a million. Um, and that figure has increased by, um, has nearly doubled in the space of a year. So the trends are quite definitely going um, in, the, in the right direction. The interesting thing is in terms of car club vehicles, the, the number has actually fallen very slightly um, in the last year. Um, which does tend to suggest that we are getting more efficient use of vehicles, um, which is probably a good sign as well. Um, and in terms of what this means for private car ownership, when you take into account um, people who get rid of uh, second or third vehicles or decide not to buy another vehicle or decide not to buy a vehicle, or in some cases decide to get rid of the one vehicle they've got, the figures that we come up with is, is that about 20 private cars are being replaced for each car club vehicle we have. Um, so it's certainly um, making a dent on the overall um, figures, not a, not a big enough one, but, but a dent nonetheless. Um, can I have the next slide? <clears throat> now, one of the key things that links in, um, and this, this is one of the points that's um, touched on in the toolkit, is the need to shift over to, um, to EV car clubs. And I'm pleased to say that car clubs already are um, uh, helping move the way forward in that respect. The percentage of uh, uh, e uh, percentage of car code cars that are EVs is now at about 12% across the country. Um, and that's against a, a national figure of roughly 1%. Um, obviously that figure is uh, now rising quite quickly, but it's still got a very long way to go. Um, and the other useful fact is we're actually able to see some trends in terms of how people feel about using EVs, which is useful to get an idea of, of what needs to be done if we're going to roll them out much more successfully across the country. So the good news is that people actually like driving EVs and they tend to, to find um, them fairly easy to drive and comfortable to drive. The big problem comes with the charging infrastructure uh, and actually using it, problems with it working, problems with it being available, um, problems with being able to understand how to use it. Um, and in terms of being able to, to have this effective shift over, then being able to get a, a, a much more wider provision of, of EV infrastructure that's easy to use is clearly um, a key, po key part in all this. Okay, next slide, please. 
I just wanted to mention the, the wider impact of car sharing because um, what it demonstrates as well is that car sharing, lift sharing, other forms of sharing um, help bring about changes in personal use, which quite clearly have wider benefits. So I've touched on there that the, the first one that 17% um, of members actually got rid of their cars um, when they joined um, a, a, a car club, which is a significant one. But perhaps more relevantly is the extent to which they, they end up using um, other forms of travel, particularly um, active travel, cycling rises significantly and public transport. Um, not surprising in the greater scheme of things that this happens, but it demonstrates that people's patterns um, do change quite significantly. Um, and so it's giving them the, the, the shove and as many incentives as possible to make them do so. And people do actually clearly do it. Um, for the remaining uh, couple of slides I've got, I just want to give two examples of uh, schemes that have come across that have worked um, effectively that I think are relevant to, to where we are today. If I can have the next one, please. Um, firstly, this was just an example um, up in Scotland, Highland Council, um, where we had um, a, a council that wanted to um, change the situation it had with widespread use of personal vehicles um, for business use. And it actually set up an internal car club um, within the council um, for this, and it worked with um, Enterprise to do this. The significant thing was the um, change that it, that it brought in terms of usage. I've got the figure there, 28% uh, drop in mileage, um, which meant a 37% drop in um, carbon emissions. Um, and for, as far as the council was concerned, there was a significant financial benefit as well because it cut travel costs quite significantly. Um, so it's a good example of a, of a virtual circle um, that, that you get from doing this. And next slide, please. And this brings us back to um, lift sharing. Um, this is the situation in Solihull with um, Arup. You had a particular problem to do with um, having a site that was uh, no longer sufficient to be able to cope with the, the, the private use, um, the, the number of vehicles that were being used there. Um, so they uh, um, had a scheme which they relaunched in 2019 um, focused on encouraging lift share with various um, incentives to do so, um, both in terms of, of uh, rewards for doing it and the drawbacks of people who continue to actually um, insist on drive, um, going there as single drivers. Um, and again, I've got some of the, uh, the, the, the figures down there. Um, the vast majority of the staff signed up to it. Um, over half of them have actually um, shared commuting um, with other colleagues there. And um, in terms of the amount of car travel that was avoided, six and a half million miles was the, the figure that had been come up with so far. So again, not insignificant. So if we just go very quickly to the last slide, which is just to point out that, um, uh, as I hope a lot of you know, um, uh, Kami UK does produce a lot of guidance and support on these things. Um, I'm pleased to see that the new um, the new toolkit um, does give a, a lot of a, a lot of advice, but also links certainly with car share and some of the other parts of the toolkit um, to the advice that Como has. So we've got quite a few years experience um, in doing this. So we are a resource there. We're always happy to, to help with any advice that, that people need. Um, and we have a lot of documents on the website that are aimed specifically at being able to uh, encourage and, and improve the situations that exist out there already with um, shared transport. So uh, do please um, uh, feel free to have a look if you haven't done so before. Um, and I think that's prob probably it from our point of view. I think that's probably quite quick, but uh, I'm sure people are probably at this stage where we'd lo like a bit more um, discussion and answering some of the questions. That was brilliant, Matthew. Thanks very much. So it's not that time where we're going to do a Q&A session. So can I ask all of our panellists to now switch on their mics and their cameras? Um, I can see Matthew at the moment, but nobody else. I'm assuming everybody's switching everything on. So um, I was going to kick off because we had a couple of questions posted when people registered. And um, this one is for Harvey. It's quite straight to the point, but I think it's something that most people are sort of thinking about is um, what funding pots are the DFT aware of to support local authorities and businesses with this toolkit? It's always about the money, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very good question. Um, so my understanding is there's no, there's no direct government funding um, at this stage. 
um, which is obviously not massively helpful. Um, but I believe uh, the toolkit does kind of highlight a particular, um, a particular avenue where you can apply for funding under a particular section or something, but I can't remember the top of my head. Um, I can dig it out and um, post it in the chat if that's helpful. Yeah, I'm um, sure that would be yeah. well received. That's lovely. Thanks a lot, Harvey. Sorry to sort of put you on the spot with quite a sharp question. Um, the next Please. one that came through, yes? Um, the uh, toolkit also highlights that uh, local authorities can utilise Section 106 money um, uh, as long as it's covering, uh, like it, it links somehow to that development. So if a su supermarket has been built locally, and you can engage with that supermarket, help their staff share cars to work, then you, then you can utilise that money. And quite a lot of local authorities have got pretty big pots of funding available that they could then uh, allocate into uh, promoting lift sharing. Lovely. Thanks very much, Ellie. Um, the next question that came through during the registration process was um, it's probably more geared towards Ali, but is it's with as with public transport, density of users is essential to the viability of shared transport. One way to achieve this is for groups of employers to club together to run a joint lift sharing scheme. Can you give an example of this and any tips on how to get potential partners interested in cooperating? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean the 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 simple maths of lift sharing is, is the critical mass needed for lift sharing is two people. So as long as you've got two people traveling the same way at the same time, you can arrange lift sharing. Obviously, the more people you've got traveling the same way with their journeys on the system, the better. And we've got examples from huge uh, like business parks and industrial start sites like the work we do with Prologis, who have got the big Sainsbury's and Tesco's, all their depots, all working together to maximize not just lift sharing, but also look at how to change bus routes and things coming to that site down to one pilot we're doing just now with um, uh, Hethel Engineering Centre. It's only got 200 people at that site, lots of SMEs, five or six people in each one. But by bringing them together as a cluster and getting them all to go through kind of the data analysis, and then we from that, we've immediately seen huge opportunities to help people uh, to share cars. And we can start identifying if someone said they're willing to share a car and there's someone who lives around the corner from them, we can connect those two people directly together through the system. So it doesn't really matter as long as you've got more than two people traveling, you can do it. But in terms of, of making it um, efficient in terms of marketing, and marketing is the main cost in this, you need to promote what you've got to your audience. Um, if you can cluster together groups of businesses and come up with a consistent brand and a consistent message to them, and even have a big sign post at the entrance to the to the business park or wherever, you can you can hit a lot of eyeballs very at a very low cost. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. Can I, um, can I and, very brief, briefly to that one, Sue? Yes, please um, do. do just, just to say, I think one thing um, people could consider doing is linking into local travel plan networks um, to try and get, get employers uh, matched together. Um, I think West Yorkshire Combined Authority might be one of the ones that, that uh, has tried this. Um, but it's certainly, as, as a way of trying to, to get in and, and find who might be interested, it's, it's a, a good route to try. Really useful. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Um, the next question that came in as part of the registration process is, is lift sharing likely to be the only way that personal mobility by car can be sustained due to the high levels of embodied carbon emitted in the manufacturing of cars and batteries? This could mean a car fleet of closer to 5 million rather than 30, sorry, 30 million. Who'd like to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll have a bash at starting us off. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we need to recognise is that the car industry is um, a massive contributor to the UK economy. And whether we like that or not, it is the case. So um, policymakers are always torn between, you know, this issue of having to continue to keep a healthy car market and keep cars being sold in large numbers versus obviously all of the other um, environmental issues that we've been discussing today. I mean, to answer the question, I think in a perfect world, that is how we need to, do, you know, lift sharing and car sharing is how we ultimately need to, um, uh, we, you know, we can achieve continued car use um, without, um, you, you know, continuing to um, see increased emissions. But I think perhaps going beyond that, I mean, what really interests me is not so much 
sort of personal car ownership, the model that we're very familiar with now, but a much more shared ownership of a kind of um, infrastructure, if you like, of vehicles that we can all use when we need them rather than having them sitting on our drive um, unutilized for most of the time. But that does require a major shift in the way that we think about how cars are sold and how much of the economy revolves around that industry. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, another question that's come through, um, it's quite direct again. When does the DFT believe people will feel comfortable sharing a car considering the COVID implications? Yeah, that's another, that's another good question. Uh, quite tricky to answer, I think. But um, I suppose like the first thing to say is like, I suppose my understanding is that there are like, no COVID restrictions. So we are allowed to uh, share share transport, share cars, etc. Um, and I suppose there will be, um, I suppose, there's some, some sort of a push to encourage people to do that and to think about lift sharing more. Um, when people will actually feel comfortable doing that, it's hard to say. Um, I know we have... Um, a team of behavioural scientists who will probably be really interested in looking at that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's hard to hard to put an estimate of when people will feel comfortable. I think it's a very much a personal choice. Um, I personally would, yeah, I personally wouldn't mind sharing a car with someone, um, especially in the current climate with the, the cost of living and stuff. If it saves me a few a few quid, then uh, I'll probably I'll probably consider it. So yeah, difficult yeah. one to answer, I think, but a good one, good question. Yeah, very good question, but very personal. And um, what I love about it, um, the customers who are using the LiveShare platform at the moment, they have a, a, a access to a whole host of marketing material. And one of the ones that we posted last year was cut your fuel costs in half this week. Really powerful, but just so bang on message. Um, there's then a question about, has the DFT thought about supporting local authorities by taking a lead on procurement so that local authorities can utilize a framework to procure lift sharing services that would reduce workload? Um, and put more focus onto the delivery. Um, I sort of answered that briefly when we were going through the webinar. LiftShare is now available on a Crown Commercial Service framework. It's called the Spark framework. I can't remember the RM number, um, but it is there to address some of those um, issues because we recognize the heavy lifting that is involved in procurement. Um, so the next question I've got is um, posted during the um, webinar today. It says, is LiftShare's barrier to being a foundation in transport similar to that of implementing house insulation before embracing renewables green energy? How do we help normalize these foundation principles? A four-seater car with one person broadly wastes 75% of its potential in the same way as renewable energy leaking from a poorly insulated house represents a waste. So it's, you know, how do we how do we normalize and make lift sharing the de facto means of getting to work or you know, make the lift sharing economy really cool? Shall I take that, Sue? Please do. So, so it's a great question. Um, I, I'm, I've struggled for the last 20 years to work out why it hasn't taken off in, in, so, in, so, in the way that it should have done because it makes such sense. But when we look at say recycling, which also makes a lot of sense, um, that took a huge campaign, a huge public awareness campaign to raise awareness of, of the issue and the opportunity. And they made it really easy. They gave us two bins to make it easy. The challenge with um, uh, lift sharing is, is, particularly on the commute, is the commute was excluded uh, from compulsory um, auditing and reporting when they announced the scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. So no company was reporting on their commute emissions. They just focused in on the energy emissions that they were producing. And as a result, for the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, energy emissions from businesses have cut, been cut by something like 50 or 60%, whereas commute emissions have actually gone up. What needs to happen to normalize this is companies need to start reporting on their commute and business miles emissions in the same way they do on their commute emissions and if they, on their, on their energy emissions. Um, because if they had to do that, then they would soon see that if you're an office-based business, somewhere between 30 and 40% of your emissions will be coming from your commuting and your business miles. And it's something that you can act on right now, as has been shown by the pandemic. So I think we need to uh, give transport and commuting the same area, amount of focus as energy and waste has had in the last decade. Lovely. Thanks very much. 
Um, can, Tim, can I come in there, Susan? Oh, yes, please. I'm so sorry, Matthew. I keep doing that. Over to you. Um, really, really, just to add to, to what Ali's saying, uh, I think it's, it's very much a question of, of uh, it, these things are incremental over time. You have to have a combination of, of um, incentives that you can offer people um, and uh, a proper explanation of what can be done and how things can work um, tied up against um, increasing disincentives for people who want to continue basically having their own private car and driving that wherever they want with just them in, them inside. Um, and there, there's you know lots of them that are out there um ju just as you know a, a, a possible idea scrappage schemes you know is, is is one is to actually incentivize people to get to get rid of their personal cars and something that that tim touched on um in terms of car share is that there, there are different types of car share that the, there's the traditional model of, of a, a a large um uh, car club provider like Enterprise or Co Wheels who have cars all over the country, but we have community car clubs as well. People can set up their own local one, and there's peer to peer car sharing where groups of people can just get together and agree to take one of their private cars and share that amongst themselves. So it's all these all these different things that with in increased you know publicity of how they work and incentives to make them work. That's how we gradually shift away from this idea of, of what has been sold to people for a long time of um, here's the, the latest brand new shiny car, go out and buy your own version. And when, you, when you've had decades and decades of that sort of advertising, it's not going to be, it's, we shouldn't be too surprised that trying to shift that oil tanker around, as it were, is not something that can be done that quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. And, I, and I, I actually think the issue of car use is somewhat unique in all of this i, I mean I, I i take on board the kind of uh, comment about um home insulation and and i i do agree but i mean i think with home insulation it's more of a kind of head decision whereas using your car is very much a heart decision in a way and and as matthew says we've been kind of indoctrinated over many years that using your car is your personal freedom and and we do it without thinking uh, and don't get me wrong I, I love cars I've worked in the car industry all my life and um, you, you know so I, I'm I, I like cars as much as the next person but I liken it a little bit to the work that we did for years and years and years on eco driving right so if you drive in a certain way you can easily save 20% on your fuel bill. It's really, really simple, a little bit like lift sharing. It doesn't cost any money. You just behave slightly differently and you can save big money. But people very rarely do it. And that's because they want to drive how they want. And equally, in this case, they want to use their cars how they want. So there's a real cultural battle that we have to uh, uh, go through here rather than just a sort of pragmatic one where we would say, look, if you do this, you can save energy in your home by putting loft insulation in. With cars, it's a more, much more kind of heart-shaped heart battle rather than a head-shaped battle. And, and that's, I guess, why we're here today. Just, just to slightly challenge this narrative around it being very hard. It is hard, but it is possible. I mean, Arup has come up as an example twice. There are many other examples. Arup got 50% of their staff sharing cars in three months. So yes, they were thinking with their hearts and their heads, but they made they made it easy by providing reserve parking space for sharers. They didn't have to share every day, they just have to share three days a week. And they had to authenticate each time they did to show that they were sharing. It was a simple thing. So they went from eight to 50. Imagine if we did that at every employer across the country. We could do it. If we were big and bold and brave about this and started promoting it, we can do it. So let's not think this is so hard it's impossible. This can happen at every local authority for their own staff and they can help promote it to businesses across the country. And if we all did what Eric did, the change would be huge and it'd be saving people a lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. I just um, understand, I suppose from a personal perspective, is I sense that there's a bit of a, 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 a shift in public awareness of how to be more conscious about your global impact or your climate or your carbon impact even. And people think of it in a more, in a more sustainable way. So I think there's, that's, that's kind of been a shift for the last 10 or so years. And I feel like this is an opportunity now to, to flag up Okay, what, what is working well in, 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 in the lift share space or being more sustainable with your travel? And then and just to make people more aware of how they can contribute in a positive way. So I think in terms of how do you make it common practice and a de facto option, I think we're, going, we're kind of going for a transition where people are more aware and are looking for more options. So I think it's a good opportunity to try and capitalise on it on now and, and going forward. Um, 
and I'm, I'm, I suppose I can say from a, from a DFT perspective as well, is that I suppose we are looking for the opportunities to, to, to shine a light on, on good practice um, and encourage people to, to think in a more sustainable way as well. So yeah, I'd have that. Um, that leads beautifully on to another question um, that's come in. It says, will there be any national promotion of lift sharing by the DFT or Her Majesty's government? Now I know there's a, a, a lift sharing week, but what can we do more? about prom promoting this to everybody so everybody you can all we can all take steps as individuals as well as companies to address this so i think i'm i'm a little bit tired in what i can say due to uh, local elections yeah. but um i suppose what i can say is the government is keen to is to continue to promote lift share and sustainable travel um and we don't have i suppose any set plans right now um, but in, yeah, I suppose in the, in the coming months, we'll have a bit more of a, a formulated idea of how we can uh, support industry a bit more and, and shine a light on the good practice and, and promote it further, if that's helpful. Okay. Anybody else want to talk about promoting Live Sharing Week and how you do it? Anecdotes that you've got from it? Um, there's a great graph of, of the impact of Live Share Week each year and the numbers of new sharers every time. So. If there's one thing you do this year to get your comms teams to do is even if you don't have a lift share scheme, you can still promote it. There'll be lots of free resource available. Um, uh, it has, I mean, it, the, the number of people joining up um, uh, to share cars during lift share week is basically 100% more than in a normal week. So if you can promote it locally, it's a free campaign um, to promote. But nationally, I mean, there are, there are simple things people that, that can be done. So on the highways, rather than having these big signs up saying, take make time to take a break so as in go faster so you've got time to take a break which i think is a crazy ad they could be used to say consider sharing a car tomorrow or um share your car for half, half your cost do what devon did devon i think devon's budget for marketing was sixteen thousand pounds a year and they got 90 percent awareness of their car share scheme sixteen thousand pounds 90 percent awareness just through signs that we could do this national we could do this nationally just to raise raise awareness Brilliant. Thanks, Sally. Um, what about safeguarding now? Um, it says, presumably there is security in matching strangers for lift sharing. I appreciate all the positives, but we must be mindful of promoting lift sharing to younger, vulnerable, to the younger and vulnerable in society. Um, do you want to take that, Ali? Yeah, very happy to. So um, lots of things to put here. So in terms of the lift share scheme, uh, we limit it to uh, 18 and over. If you are a minor, you can use the scheme, but you have to have a letter of consent from, a, from an adult in it. Um, there's lots of other safety advice on how to use the system. But I think, I think when you look at the, the data, so we've shared, had, uh, people have shared over 70 million journeys on the Live Share network since it launched. And in the last 22 years, we have never had a reported instance of any issues on the network. I think it is different, well, it's very different from hitchhiking because you are connecting with someone typically at the same place of work or potentially the same school to share, to share a car with. Um, so it is different from, from hitchhiking, but it's a, there's no, there's, um, you have a choice. You're not getting in a taxi with a stranger. You, you connect with this person before you travel with them, you speak to them, you find out about them. Sometimes people meet up with a coffee before they travel. Um, so there's lots of, lots of things to put in. I would encourage you to read the, the tips on the health, uh, health and safety on, on the Lift Share website to give you full information of, of all the ways you can I've overcome that. But in terms of the data, 70 million journeys, not an instant report in the last 20 years. Lovely. Thank you. And then there's another question about advice on um, insurance. Sorry, my screen is just bumping around. Um, it's our local car club, social enterprises, happy in principle to do the admin booking, etc., but not does not yet have set a satisfactory answer to the insurance question for the car owner. Who does this? So I suppose we could only talk about insurance around the lift sharing concept. So do you want to take that, Ali? I'll take the lift sharing one and Matthew can probably do the, the other one. Um, so on under lift sharing, all members of the Association of British, British Insurers say that it's fine to share a lift to, um, for someone to give someone else a lift as long as there's no profit made in the journey. So you can't become a hire and reward driver. You can't make a, make a profit. Um, there are some circumstances where if you're doing business travel, and you've got goods in your vehicle, your, your, your um, insurance may not cover you. So in those instances, please check with your, either your company or your insurance company. But if you're just giving a, a friend or a colleague or a neighbor a lift in your car, they can contribute towards your uh, costs without invalidating insurance, as long as you don't make a profit from that journey. 
<clears throat> I think with a wider car sharing um, insurance um, pit, it, it is a, um, a bit of a problem that um, it's in, in the middle we tend to have the problems. Obviously, at the top end, um, the bigger ones have um, insurance policies that cover all the members. Uh, and on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, it tends to be easier to sort out on with, with people adapting their own individual policies. It's when it comes to community car clubs um, that, that uh, quite a few have had difficulty finding in, in insurance policies. I, th I think it's partly because the insurance industry just hasn't really got its head around this properly yet. Um, but um, uh, as I understand it, we are making some headway there. Had headway there. And um, there are some insurance companies that, that now are, you know, looking at this seriously and starting to, to uh, offer policies. I don't deal with this one with direct, direct uh, so it could be one for um, some of my colleagues, but um, I think things are beginning to improve there. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, another question is, um, local authorities have many different priorities to hit net zero. How do you suggest they evaluate and prioritize what initiatives when there are so many that they should be implementing and when to expedite their journey to net zero? Big question. Tim, do you want to sort of kick off, kick off on that one? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, look, you know, I, we, we, we see, we work with local authorities <laughs> across the whole range of um, transport, road transport. So we see that they are under pressure to implement infrastructure for EVs. We see that they're under pressure to implement infrastructure for cycling and walking. And so I understand the problem. Um, and as I think, you know, we've all agreed, most local authorities or many local authorities have declared a climate emergency. So, you know, I guess from the point of view of um, low hanging fruit in the sense of, you know, what delivers the biggest saving with the lowest investment and i think ali reinforced the point that you know lift sharing is low cost and high reward and so for that reason i think you know it's got to be at the top of that long list of things that local authorities can consider to decarbonize quickly and and, and if it's measured properly then you know i think the rewards as we've seen in devon can, can be huge and, and the opportunities there uh, massive so you know I, I can't really guide on how best to prioritize within each individual local authority but I can urge you to consider lift sharing as being one of the ones that you should move to the top of your list because it's a, um, a you know a, a fairly low cost uh, intervention with 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 high reward thank you can I, can I just add, add to that um, Tim summarized it really well but the 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 thing I would do is rather than just jump to lift sharing or jump to car clubs or jump to public transport, start off with the data. Look, look at the data, see how people were traveling, how they're traveling now, how they want to travel, what could encourage them to travel differently. And once you've got that, then start coming up with a strategy on, on, on how to change things. Lift sharing in a, in a city center won't be your top priority. It'll be more active travel, getting people to get, get there that way. If you are anywhere where the car is king currently and you've got big parking issues, Lift sharing will clearly be have a role to play, but so will EVs, so will walking, so will cycling. But you can work out your strategy for investment um, uh, through using data wisely. And we've only got eight years to change the dial on this. We've got to get moving. So spend the next 12 months looking at the data, see what's possible right now, and then make your investment decisions. Don't just press ahead with all these big projects you, you were doing and had planned for the last 20 years, because... The world has changed and we've, we've got to start cutting carbon, particularly from transport, very fast. So get the data and then come up with a plan. I love that. I think I, I, would, I would just add to that one if I can, by by because um, I agree with what, what uh, Tim and Ali have both, both just said. Um, but but uh, a couple of points that spring to mind is, is firstly the need for um, visual change, for having things that people can actually see is, is making a difference because people need to have a sense that when it comes to transport, the world, world is changing. So, um, for example, um, bike share schemes are quite good in that respect. You know, something that's visible has an effect. Uh, and the, the point that Ali made in terms uh, as a good one is if, of how things are, are adapting, the, the, the um, expansion of e-bikes is becoming um, quite significant. They, they are very effective um, at getting some people to shift who otherwise wouldn't consider just, just cycling. Um, we have the situation with um, e-scooters that 
are now probably likely to be legalised within the next few months. And, and again, it's something that, that local authorities can, can, can take advantage of. Um, and, and, um, and tying in with that, of course, and I'm sure that most local authorities won't need any persuading on this, but there's always a tendency in the past to, to look for big infrastructural changes. And of course, big infrastructural changes, and I'm, I, you know, I'm meaning seriously big ones, are always um, uh, laden with um, financial problems, time scales, and risks of going wrong. And however politically popular they might be, because they um, are, are things that people, politicians like to associate themselves with, it can be um, a lot long time before the, the clear benefits from them actually come and so there's there's lots of other things which can be tried which are a, a lot lot cheaper brilliant um we've only got about six or seven minutes left so perhaps one or two more questions um i've got this one that says do you have any examples of impact of local authority travel plan revenue and investment um stroke staffing compared to the outcome in reduction of single occupancy vehicle trips Is that a question asking how I'm yeah. trying to think of the best best example of, of a local yeah. authority doing it for their own staff? Yeah, is it? I'll read it out again. It says, do you have any examples of impact of local authority travel plan revenue investment stroke staffing compared with the outcome in the reduction of single occupancy vehicle trips? So, you know, it's an interesting question, but it's whether anybody has actually measured that return on investment and shared it in a wider um, circle so it could be discussed to date as no, nobody's come across it so far. Not, not so, on staffing, I, I, it's hard to say, but sorry, go on, Ali. Um, I know there has, well, we, we've done our own work and I know that the DFT several years ago did uh, work looking at, an, I think, four or five different local authorities over what they had spent in terms of time and resources and marketing spend and the return in terms of miles saved and money saved by members, but also impact on um, parking costs and, and those things. And the, the hardest thing was that the, the return on investment was so good that it didn't get published. Um, uh, and we got, I got slightly upset by this because at the time it was when all smart choices were being looked into. And I think it was KPMG who were doing it for the DFT and they looked at all the smarter measures. But because gosh, the great thing with, with share, like car sharing is once people start doing it, they keep doing it. So if you get people car sharing this year, next year, 90% of them will still be sharing. The following in 90% of them will still be sharing. So even if your funding runs out, you have a long tail, long legacy tail from that investment. And we were seeing returns investment of 50, 70, 100 to one from local authorities investing in lifting schemes. But that compared to like five to 20%, to five to 10, uh, 20 uh, to one on um, for other smarter measures. So that the guidance that came out highlighted all those are not not sadly lift sharing, uh, but we've got the data. If, if, if the person asks the question, I'm sure I can dig it out and share that with them. Okay. okay, and perhaps this is our final question. And so Ali, it says, your graphs show quite a sizable number of um, are thinking of driving alone if they have an electric vehicle. Does that pose a threat to car sharing as the number of EVs grows and costs for driving them remains very cheap? Great question, yes. Um, there is a direct correlation between the perceived cost per mile and car occupancy levels. Car occupancy levels at the moment will be going up because of the high fuel prices. And as they go down, occupancy levels will go down again. Um, the challenge with, with EVs is the perception per mile cost is very low, even if your depreciation and things are far higher than the typical vehicle. So there is a real challenge that people will assume their journey is cheaper and therefore want to share less. And it is really important if we're serious about not only decarbonizing but decongesting our, our roads, we need to make sure that occupancy levels go up, which is why it was so brilliant that the TDP included a goal for occupancy to go up. We need occupancy to go up, like Tim said, if we increase it by 20%, we'll take 20% of the cars off the road. And there's like so much more capacity than that and it will save people so much more money. So um, it's really important that we, we focus in on this. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, well, I suppose it's down to me to wrap up. I'd like to thank Lando Lynx for organising today, our panel for their time, sharing their insights and um, having it such an inspiring and lively discussion. 
As I've said before, the session has been recorded and it will be shared with everybody on the Landor Links YouTube channel. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say, LiftShare are looking to build a local authority working group. So if you would like to be involved, please do contact um, myself, Susan at liftshare.com or Ali, as we really want to help you every step of the way. So thank you everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining us and have a good afternoon.